A marsh hawk travels south each winter to hunt these broken fields and fence rows, places we call cover. Here among the grasses live small mammals and birds. Without this cover, life could not exist here. This is farm country, a changing land where man and wildlife share a common ground. Today, the landscape continues to change. Farms grow larger and farm management decisions become more complex. These decisions will have an impact on all the life on the farm. A living farm attracts a variety of life, from migratory birds like Canada geese to permanent residents like the white-tailed deer. And all this life shares a common bond, a capacity to fit their needs for food and living space with modern agriculture. Many woodland creatures, like the wild turkey, eat waste grains that a farmer leaves in his winter fields. Predators on the farm play an important role in maintaining a balance between rodents and crops. Spring once again comes to farm country. The wooded areas on the farm now provide nesting, hiding places and food for an abundance of life. To sustain the rich diversity of forest life, the needs of the wildlife and the farmer must be in harmony. Grazing of trees and shrubs by livestock destroys the living space for many species of birds and mammals. Over the past 200 years, this land has changed from native prairie to fescue fields and croplands. Many creatures, like the prairie chicken, have not been able to change with it. 
This remnant flock returns each spring to this field called a booming ground. In their ancient ritual, males determine who will mate with the remaining females. All creatures on the farm depend upon the top layer of soil for life. Soil formation is a slow, complex process. It takes a hundred years to create just one inch of topsoil on agricultural land. Beneath the surface of the soil lies the secret of the landscape, life. Nematodes, bacteria, and fungi break down organic matter into molecules that plants use for food. Living soil is full of passageways for roots, water and air. Some creatures are excavators. They move subsoils to the surface and bring insects and plant materials into their subterranean homes. These decompose and help renew the soil's fertility. Across America, farms lose billions of tons of topsoil each year. In many fields, this leaves us only inches from a landscape that could not grow crops or support life. The causes are complex. Plowing the soil in the fall removes the protective vegetative cover. It also turns under waste grains that could help wildlife survive through the winter. Another practice that I think causes a lot of farmers problems is that the people that are farming the ground do not own it. So they don't really care, knowing that they won't be farming in two or three years, they really aren't concerned about a long-term commitment. Uh, us being here and, and hope to be here another, our lifetime and our children's lifetime, we try to keep the soil here where it belongs. Uh, this is one of my goals in life, is to leave it better than when I got it. To increase production, some farmers have converted pastures into croplands. This hilly, rolling terrain is more prone to erosion. Crop fields are also increasing in size. So is equipment. To maneuver this big machinery, wind breaks and other protective cover for soil and wildlife have been removed. Chemical fertilizers and hybrid seeds have helped to maintain yields as the soil continues to erode. So many farmers do not believe they have a soil erosion problem. Spring winds sweep across the landscape, a critical time for farmer and soil. 
land that lies naked and barren can lose tons of topsoil to wind and rain. Sheet erosion is the unseen menace. It removes a layer of soil without rills or gullies. Soil, pesticides and fertilizers wash into streams and rivers. There they have an impact on fish, wildlife and ultimately man. Solutions to the soil erosion problem, like the causes, are complex, and they may not be practical for every farmer. On hilly ground, farmers plow with the contour of the land. They also create terraces to hold the water and soil in place. But terraces can be expensive, even with government cost sharing. Some farmers are changing from conventional plowing to conservation tillage. This technique protects the soil by leaving at least 30% of the old crop residue in place. An extreme version called no-till leaves all the residue on top. It requires a specialized planter that drills the new seeds into the soil. This debris also creates nesting and hiding places for many species of birds and mammals. But more study is being done to determine any long-term effects on the soil and other forms of life. A field of henbit marks the warming of the spring soil. Henbit is an imported plant that looks like a wildflower. To a farmer, it's only a weed. Farm fields often lack a diversity of plant species. This creates an ecological imbalance that favors weeds and insects that compete with crops. Traditionally, farmers cultivated and planted a variety of crops to restore a temporary balance to their fields. Today, farmers rely more on herbicides and insecticides to control pests. But these chemicals can be harmful to beneficial insects, to wildlife, and to man. One of the problems we face in agriculture today is a very heavy reliance on uh, chemical pesticides, other herbicides, various chemicals to control pests. And one of the things that we've discovered in the last uh, 20 or 30 years is that uh, sometimes we actually make the problem worse by destroying uh, what we call natural enemies, uh, parasitic insects, um, and uh, spiders and other insects that uh, consume uh, insect pests. And uh, spiders are some of the most numerous of these uh, predators, these animals that eat insects, uh, in agricultural systems. And what we're trying to learn more about now is how spiders would behave in a, in a system that's less affected uh, by chemicals. We're standing right now in a, in a native uh, Midwestern prairie, and as you look around, you can see that there are many, many species of plants growing here. And um, it would be unusual to find some insect becoming a pest on, and destroying a, a, a plant out here. It's a very different situation from what we find in the croplands that have replaced it, where we have a single stand of corn or soybeans and sorghum. Uh, one thing that we generally find in a case like that is that there are many fewer kinds of natural enemies and it's much easier for a pest to gain the upper hand and uh, uh, start destroying the plants which of course in this case would be the crops that we're growing. Most of our pests are of foreign origin. They normally enter the United States without their natural enemies and in biological control we are attempting to restore 
a natural balance as it would occur in the native homes of these various pest insects. What we hope to do is to reduce the population of a particular pest insect to a level where non-economic damage will occur and so that the farmer grower can live with a certain amount of insect damage. If we can have a more diverse agriculture, if we can uh, have mixed cropping, or if we can restore uh, old methods where we had uh, generous borders around crop fields that would provide a refuge for natural enemies, that's one possibility. Then the spiders would be closer to the field and able to get in more rapidly in the spring. Another possibility would be to find which spiders are best at getting into the fields and also best at controlling pests and propagate them in the laboratory and release them. Uh, today that would probably be too expensive to handle, but since pesticides are always getting more and more expensive, we may someday come to the break-even point economically and be able to use a program of that type. In man's ongoing struggle to find inexpensive but safe methods of controlling crop pests, a program called Integrated Pest Management offers hope. It's a unique program that brings together chemical, biological, and other natural controls to fight pests. As part of this program, scouts monitor crop fields for insect and weed problems. The number of pests found determines if some type of control is cost effective. These management practices are designed to save the farmer money and to be less harmful to the environment. We are gathering vast amounts of data on farm practices, pest problems, weather information. We hope to gain a better understanding of the pest in the environment, understand what causes pest outbreaks. If we can understand this, then we can make predictions for the farmer on what he might do to avoid developing a pest problem in his field. We might avoid upsetting the balance of nature, upsetting the predators and parasites that play an extremely important part. We can avoid putting pesticides in the environment unless absolutely necessary and avoid thus causing damaging effects to wildlife, fish, and of course man himself. We are really striving to enable the farmer to produce in competition with the other factors in nature, causing as little upset to the balance as we can. For thousands of years, prairie grasses covered much of what is now America's richest farmland. Their roots reached deep, seeking the water that allowed them to live in the hot, dry climate. Conservationists are encouraging farmers to replant these native grasses on erodible areas of their farms. For grass is nature's healer. Where the soil is worn out and eroded away, grass is often the answer. Between strips of crops, some farmers plant grasses to control erosion. These grassy areas also make hiding and nesting places for many species of birds and mammals. I try to manage my farm uh, naturally for uh, crop production, but there are a lot of things you can do in, in farm management. 
uh, to enhance wildlife. You can plan your harvesting of uh, hay crops and forage crops at times of the year that uh, you're really not causing a lot of damage to uh, nesting habitat where you know where turkeys and quail and songbirds are nesting. There's a lot of things you can do to enhance wildlife in pasture management situations too by not clipping pastures during uh, months of the year when fawns are too young to get out of the way of the mower. And, and at the same time, most of the turkey and, and quail and songbirds have successfully nested usually by July. Across the landscape, farmers have created thousands of farm ponds. These ponds have become oases for all forms of life. A living pond supports a diverse community of fish and other aquatic life. It also attracts predators like the great blue heron. Unfenced ponds can become polluted, almost lifeless bodies of water. They are of little value to wildlife and present a health hazard to livestock. <laughs> the harvest practices here on my farm have to pretty well be designed to protect my soil due to the nature of my soil resource. I've got rolling ground and uh, I almost have to leave crop residue on the ground to avoid serious erosion. I don't do much fall plowing. I leave that crop residue on the ground all winter to protect the soil. And at the same time, I get a, a double benefit out of it by uh, having that protective cover for wildlife and there's crop gleanings that are left on the field. In a lot of cases, I leave point row strips that I don't harvest for winter food and cover for wildlife. From a cropping standpoint, that's about the best I can do for wildlife. The fall harvest is over, and the sounds of farm machines are silent. Only waste grains lie as reminders of the end of another growing season.
These waste grains left in farm fields now attract flights of migratory birds on their annual trek south. As the last days of fall ebb into the short days of winter, only the permanent residents of farm country remain. Their survival will depend on the availability of winter cover and food. <laughs> 